a couple of interesting things that we humans do. Uh, one is object manipulation and movement. Mm -hmm. And of course, movement was something that was done. That was another big invention, being able to move mm -hmm. around the environment. Um, and the other one is this sensory mechanism, how we sense the environment. One of the coolest high definition ones is vision. Uh, how big are those inventions in the history of um, life on Earth? Vision, movement, uh, I mean, again, extremely important, going back to the origin of animals, the Cambrian explosion, where suddenly you're seeing eyes in the fossil record. And you can, it, it's not necessarily, again, lots of people historically have said, what use is half an eye? And, and, and you know, you can go in a series of steps uh, from a, a, a light sensitive spot on a flat piece of tissue to an eyeball with a lens and so on. Um, if you assume no more than, than I, I don't remember this, this was a specific model that I have in mind, but it was you know 1% change or half a percent change for each generation. How long would it take to evolve an eye as we know it? And the answer is half a million years. Um, it doesn't have to take long. That's not how evolution works. That's not a, that's not an answer to the question. It just shows you can reconstruct the steps and you can work out roughly how, how it can work. So it's not that big a deal to evolve an eye. Um, but once you have one, then there's nowhere to hide. And uh, it, again, we're, we're back to predator-prey relationships. We're back to all the benefits that being able to see brings you. And if you think you know, philosophically what bats are doing with echolocation and so on, I have no idea, but I suspect that they form an image of the world in pretty much the same way that we do. It's just a matter of mental reconstruction. So I suppose the other thing about sight, there are single-celled organisms that have got a lens and uh, a, a retina and, and, a, and a cornea and so on. Basically, they've got a camera-type eye in a single cell. They don't have a brain. Um, what they understand about their world is impossible to say, but but they're capable of coming up with, with the same structures to do so. So I suppose then is that once you've got things like eyes, then you have a, a big driving pressure on the central nervous system to figure out what it all means. And we come around to your other point about manipulation, sensory input, and so on. About you, now, now you, 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 you have a huge requirement to understand what your environment is and what it means and how it reacts and where you should run away and where you should stay put. Actually, on that point, let me—I I don't know if you know the work of uh, Donald Hoffman, who talks about, who uses the argument, um, the mechanism of evolution, to say that. There's not necessarily a strong evolutionary value to seeing the world as it is. So objective reality, that our perception actually is very different from what's objectively real. We're living inside an illusion and we're basically the entire, uh, the entire set of species on Earth, I think, I, I, I guess are competing in a space that's an illusion that's distinct from, that's far away from physical reality as it is, the, as defined by physics. I'm not sure it's an illusion so much as a bubble. I mean, we, we have a sensory input, which is a fraction of what we could have a sensory input on. Um, and we interpret it in terms of what's useful for us to know to stay alive. So yes, it's an illusion in that sense, but so it's a, you know, a tree is physically there. And if you walk into that tree, you, you know, th there is, it's not purely a delusion. There's some physical reality to it. So it's a, it's a, uh, sensory slice into reality as it is, but because it's just a slice, you're missing a big picture. But he says that that slice doesn't necessarily need to be a slice it could be a complete fabrication that's just consistent amongst the species, which is an interesting, or at least it's, it's a humbling mm. realization that our perception is limited and our cognitive abilities are limited. And at least to me, it's argument from evolution. I don't know how much, how, how strong that is as an argument, but, I do think that life can exist in the mind. Uh, yes. In the same way that you can do a virtual reality video game and you can have a vibrant life inside that place. And that place is not real in some sense, but you could still have a vibrant, all the same forces of evolution, all the same competition, the dynamics of uh, between humans you can have. But I don't know if... Um, 
I don't know if there's evidence for that being the thing that happened on Earth. It seems that Earth... I think in either environment, I wouldn't deny that you could have exactly the world that you talk about. And it would be very difficult to, uh, you know, the, the, the idea um, in, in Matrix movies and so on, yes. that the whole world is completely a, a, a construction um, and, and we're fundamentally deluded. It's, it's, it's difficult to say that's impossible or couldn't happen. Or, and, and certainly we construct in our minds what the outside world is. But we do it on input and that input, I, I would hesitate to say it's not real. Um, because it's precisely how we do understand the world. We, you know, we have eyes, but if you keep someone in, <laughs> apparently this kind of thing happens. Someone kept in a dark room for five years or something like that, and they, they never see properly again because they, the 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 what neural wiring that underpins how we interpret vision never developed. You know, you need when you watch a child develop, it walks it walks into a table, it bangs his head on the table, and it, it hurts, uh, and. and <laughs> Now you've got a, two inputs. You've got one pain from this sharp edge, and, and number two, you probably you've, you've touched it and realised it's there. It's a sharp edge, and you've got the visual input, and you put the three things together and think, I don't want to walk into a table again. So you're learning, and 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 it's a limited reality, but it's a true reality. And if you don't learn that properly, then you will get eaten, you will get hit by a bus, you will not survive. Yeah. Uh, and and same if you're if you're in 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 some kind of uh, let's say computer construction of reality. I'm not in my ground here, but if if you construct the laws that this is what reality is inside in, 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 inside this, then you play by those laws. Yeah, well, I mean, as long as the laws are consistent. Yeah. So just like you said in the lab, the interesting thing about the simulation question, yes, it's hard to know if we're living inside a simulation, but also, yes, it's possible to do these kinds of experiments in the lab now more and more. To me, the interesting question is how realistic does a virtual reality game need to be for us to not be able to tell the difference? A more interesting question to me is how realistic or interesting does a virtual reality world need to be in order for us to want to stay there forever or much longer than physical reality? Prefer that place. And also prefer it not as we prefer uh, hard drugs, but prefer it in a deep, meaningful way, mm. in the way we mm. we enjoy. I mean, I suppose the, the issue with the Matrix, I, I, th I imagine that it's possible to to delude the mind sufficiently that you genuinely, in that way, do think that you are uh, interacting with the real world when, in fact, the whole thing's a simulation. How good does a simulation need to be to be able to do that? Well, it, it, it needs to... Um, convince you that all your sensory input is correct and accurate and and, and 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 joins up and makes sense now that sensory input is not something that we're born with we're born with a sense of touch we're born with eyes and so on but we don't know how to use them we don't know what to make of them we go around we bump into trees we cry a lot we're in pain a lot we you know we're <laughs> we're, we're basically booting up the system so that it, it can make head or tail of the sensory input that it's getting and that sensory input's not just a one-way flux of things it's also you have to walk into things you have to hear things you have to put it together now if you've got just babies in in the matrix who are slotted into this I don't think they have that kind of sensory input I don't think they would have any way to make sense of New York uh, as a world that they're part of. The the brain is just not developed in that way. So. Well, I can't make sense of New York in this physical reality <laughs> either. But yeah, I mean, but you said pain and the walking into things. Well, you can create a pain signal. And as long as it's consistent that certain things result in pain, you can start to construct a reality. There's some, maybe, maybe you disagree with this, but I think we are born almost with a desire to be convinced by our reality like a, mm. a desire to make sense of our reality. Oh, I'm sure we are, yes. Like, like, so there's an imperative. So whatever that reality is given to us, like the table hurts, fire's hot. Yeah. I think we want to be deluded <laughs> in the sense that we want to make a simple, like Einstein, simple theory of the thing around us. Yeah. We want that simplicity. And so um, maybe the hunger for the simplicity is the thing that could be used to construct a pretty dumb simulation that 
uh, that tricks us. So maybe tricking humans doesn't require building a universe. <laughs> No, I, I don't. I mean, I, I, this is not what I work on, so I yes, don't know how I close don't, to it we I don't are. Think but, anyone works on but I, I agree with Mark you Zuckerberg. that. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that it's a morally justifiable thing to do. But it's it's yeah. is it possible in principle? Um, I think it would be very difficult, but I don't see why in principle it wouldn't be possible. And I agree with you that it's it's um, that we try to understand the world, we try to integrate the sensory inputs that we have, and we try to come up with a hypothesis that explains what's going on. I think, though, that we have huge input from the social context that we're in. We don't do it by ourselves. We don't kind of blunder around in a, in a universe by ourselves and, and, and understand the whole thing. We're told by the people around us uh, what things are and what they do, and they, you know, language is coming in here and so on. So it would have to be an extremely impressive simulation to simulate all of that.